everybody here this morning. You know, I'm really glad that uh, God has given us some rain. Uh, we've needed it. We've needed it for a long time. And I'm, I'm thankful with all of you that God uh, delivered that. Uh, there are a lot of famous Bible quotes that aren't actually Bible verses at all. Uh, one of them is, cleanliness is next to godliness. Uh, that's uh, it's not in the Bible. It's just, Maybe some good advice, but it's not there. Uh, be a lender, not a borrower. Not, not scripture. It, even though it's good advice, that one's actually uh, Hamlet, not Hebrews. Along the same lines, money is the root of all evil. And that's not in the Bible either. It's the love of money is the root of all evil. That's a subtle uh, but important difference. Probably the most famous Bible verse that isn't in the Bible, is God helps those who help themselves. It's not in the Scriptures. In our text today, we're going to look at some of the people that God helps. But the circumstances of that help, their response to it, and the outcome of it all, serve to show the true nature of the grace of God in a way that reflects the truth of the Gospel accurately. Something that the saying, God helps those who help themselves can't claim. You know, it's really funny how different people are from each other. People respond to all sorts of different things differently. Uh, some people uh, respond to you know, interruptions differently. Some, some people are go-with-the-flow kind of people. When, when something changes or, or there's an unexpected happenstance, they can very easily adapt and, and keep going. An unplanned two-hour visit from a friend uh, doesn't even make them skip a beat. On the other hand, there are people who need stability and routine. When their plans get knocked off course, they don't function well at all. They regiment their day and activities in, into categories. And keeping a schedule is, is extremely important. Now, I used to think I was more like the first kind of person, but I didn't know what an interruption was until I started caring for an infant. I may be more routine-friendly than I used to think, but Paul definitely strikes me more as the routine kind of person. Our text this morning is in Acts chapter 16, and it continues following Saul of Tarsus, or Paul, as he's known for the rest of Acts. He had that mighty encounter that we talked about last week with Jesus on the Damascus Road. And he began spreading the gospel like a fiend. He did not stop. We pick up with our heroes in Philippi as they come there to preach the good news. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money by her owners, by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And the Spirit at that moment left her. You know, I, I have to admit, I absolutely love this episode in the life of Paul. He's going to pray like any good believer would. He's prioritizing the things of God. When the appointed time came, he went where he was supposed to go. And as a man of God, Paul is dedicating himself to teaching and to prayer. I mean, he's, he was commissioned by God on that Damascus road to, to get out there and, and be an instrument for God. He knows what he's doing. He's a man on a mission. The time is for prayer to come, and so he goes to pray. It's as easy as that. But of course, that day it isn't. There's a woman who won't shut up. She's possessed by a spirit that allows her to predict the future, and her masters profit from her affliction. They've got their own little oracle of Philippi. And apparently the Spirit does know what it's talking about because it identifies Paul and his compatriots accurately. Servants of the Most High God. 
And so Paul, compassionate as he is, takes a detour from his prayers in order to heal this poor, afflicted woman. Oh, except that's not at all what happens. In fact, he ignores her for days, it says. He tries to ignore her. Doesn't she know that Paul is busy? He's got places to be. He's, a, he's an important guy. But she keeps babbling about who Paul and his friends are. And he had had enough. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you, come out of her. He didn't act out of compassion. He didn't act out of pity. He didn't act out of grace. He acted because this woman was ticking him off and in the way. But I think that's the nature of how God calls us to bring peace and order in a world of chaos. This morning, if you're wondering what God wants you to do, what things He wants you to take care of, think about it this way. What's the one thing that's bothering you right now more than any other thing that you can actually do something about? I guarantee you it's bothering you because God is calling you to action. You might think, well, it's not, it, it's bothering people, other people just as much as it's bothering me. Maybe not. Your life, your experiences, your skills, your personality, they're all unique. And when brokenness, a specific brokenness in this world begins to grind your gears, that's God telling you to do something about it. Paul's annoyance manifests the freedom of Christ. But this act has some unintended consequences. As things often go, no good deed goes unpunished. She's being exploited by darkness, and her affliction has been monetized. And people do this today. Think about drug dealers who profit off addiction, or casinos that exploit usually the poorest of society for their own personal gain. These powers and institutions that are exploitative, they don't like it when people are free and whole. It hurts their bottom line. When their owners, excuse me, verse 19, when her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews, and they're throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods after they had been severely flogged and they were thrown into prison. And the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. You see, the darkness of the kingdom of this world is built on the back of brokenness. We all know this intrinsically. And I'm sure you might not say it that way, but we, we know it in other ways. We say it in other ways. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Or maybe we say it in the form of a question. What is this world coming to? When we fight back, against that world by changing the small corner of brokenness that calls out to us, the systems of oppression, hate, greed, lust, and exploitation are not brought down so easily. Once you start addressing the things that the, that in, in the world that call out to you, more will call out to you. And you'll be capable of tackling bigger and bigger things because of the trials that you've already overcome. If you keep going down that path, and you should because that's the gospel, you're going to bump up against these systems, and they want nothing more than to kill you and to continue rolling down the road. For Paul and his friends, I'm sure that they thought that's exactly what might be happening. Every time they got arrested, it could be the last one. They could have finally poked the bear enough times to get their heads bit off. They could only hope and pray that their audacious hope that one small girl's life was worth it and it wouldn't be their undoing. And indeed, that's what they do. 
They sing and they pray. Verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And at once, the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up. And when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. So they're sitting in jail, praying that God will deliver them. And to, and to their surprise, he follows through. You would expect, just as the jailer did, that they would take this opportunity for escape that God put in front of them. After all, God helps those who help themselves. The problem is, if they take it, then they make the jailer an innocent victim. He's just doing his job. It's not his job to judge them either guilty or innocent. His job is to guard them. And there are severe consequences for letting a prisoner escape. So severe that when the jailer realizes what's happened, He's prepared to take his own life rather than face them. But Paul shouted, verse 28, Don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You see, Paul realized that the deliverance of God would not require leaving an innocent man to die. When the gates were open and the opportunity of security and safety beckoned, they were given the choice. But they know that when the messianic banquet table is set, God does not help those who help themselves, but helps those who deny themselves in the service of not only who they could be, but what the world around them could be. If it was me, I would run out of that gate. I prayed for deliverance and God gave it. But I'm weak and worldly, and Paul isn't. He thinks about it. He knows that leaving a man to die doesn't fit with the gospel. He knows that whatever God has in mind, this Philippians jailer's death is not a part of it. We aren't free to pursue our own appetites. We aren't free to, to live our bliss. But to engage with brokenness. Jesus' example, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, they show us that we are to deny ourselves, to pick up our cross and follow they could have left that jail cell, but instead they decided to embody the gospel, just as this whole story does. Verse 31, they replied, so Paul and Silas replied, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. And then, they, then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. These men are arrested, imprisoned, and God delivers them. And because of their godly deliverance, a whole household is changed. Just as Jesus was arrested, delivered from the grave, and the whole world is changed. Both Paul and Jesus could have chosen not to deny themselves. We sing the song, He could have called 10,000 angels. But the gospel, that is the good news of Jesus, that is that by denying ourselves, we find life, not only for ourselves, but for others. Deny yourself in a way that benefits those around you. It is for freedom that Christ...
Christ sets you free. Not selfishness, not self-indulgence, not your bliss, or any other thing. Well, what are ways that you can let that freedom of Christ break out around you? How can you help your family find freedom? When's the last time you read your Bible with your children? Went out of your way to treat your spouse? Intentionally spoke kindness and wisdom? When everything inside you wants to lash out with anger? Sure, you can take the indulgent route. You can use the freedom you've been given for yourself. But that is not why Christ set you free. The freedom of the gospel, when properly lived, results in the freedom of those around us. What about the people we've written off? And, and don't pretend like you don't know who I'm talking about. We all have those people that at our, that at our worst moments we, we count as lost causes. What would happen, I wonder, if we used our freedom to seek and save the lost? What if we looked at lost causes as precious in the sight of God? What if we acknowledged the truth that God has called us all into and loved as Christ first loved us? Well, I can tell you what happened when 12 men did it. 2,000 years ago. You. Here today. Twelve men who engaged the brokenness they saw that called out to them changed the world. Who knows what would happen if everyone here this morning decided to do the same. But we haven't been doing that. We use our freedom to live for ourselves, not for freedom. It is for freedom that Christ set us free. The jail cell of sin and selfishness and death is open. We have been delivered. Christ did that. And there's nothing that we could have done and nothing that we can add to what Christ did. However, freedom is not freedom to help ourselves. It's all that the world has to offer. True freedom begets freedom. So ask yourself, am I a source of liberation for the people I work with, my family, my friends? If not, what can I do to be a source of life and light? Maybe you have a terrible family, bad co-workers, cruddy friends. At just the right time, while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. It's not at just the right time Christ died for the perfect people who had their lives together and were righteous. He died not for what we were, but what we could be. God does not help those who help themselves. He helps those who can't. And God has asked us to join Him and deny ourselves for what others might become not what they are. This morning we offer an invitation that we might deny ourselves, be buried with Christ in baptism, and raised in newness of life. If you need to do that this morning, this is the time. Maybe you did that a long time ago, but you need to recommit to the cause of freedom. If you need to do that this morning, this is the time for that as well. Would you come? As we stand, as we stand.